Hello everyone and welcome to our sixth free webinar in the Smart Building series. Hope everyone's doing well out there. Today we are talking about six disruptive trends in lighting for the next decade. Uh, so some really, really interesting content um, coming up and I obviously want to say thank you and welcome to Brad Kerner, who is VP Product Development at SEMA. Uh, Hi Brad, how are you doing? Hi James, good. Glad to Thanks be for, here. Good, I'm, I'm glad and obviously thank you for taking the time to, uh, to discuss all this with us today. Um, and what are we discussing? Well, really disruptive waves of innovation um, and how they are going to impact lighting during the next decade. Uh, Brad's put together some really interesting slides for us. It's going to talk us through uh, some of these concepts um, over the next sort of 25 to 30 minutes. Um, so there'll be lots of uh, information to take in. Uh, and of course, we always want to make this as interactive as possible. So if you would like to ask questions to Brad or to myself, then please do. Uh, there is a Q&A function on your screen somewhere, I'm sure. So you can type in there. Um, we'll get those questions and I'll, I'll pose them to Brad later on. Um, other than that, look, we are recording this session as usual, and we will be putting that up on our YouTube channels and also um, it goes up on uh, as a podcast on Spotify and also iTunes as well so best thing to do is search for smart building series and you can subscribe to us on one of those channels I think that's pretty much it um, over to you Brad interesting Great. to hear what you've got to say Great. Yeah. And I'd like to uh, just preface this by saying that, you know, looking 10 years ahead in a, a fast moving technology industry, like building technology and lighting and digital media, the point of this is really to give you guys some creative inspiration and to think ahead. Not a lot of this is on the market in its current form, but it, uh, it's going to come fast. So what we're seeing is a, uh, a growing convergence between brand, which is really the development of lifestyle experience uh, with place, right? Which is really the social experience. And of course the COVID-19, everybody's been made really aware of the importance of place and social experience and how we relate to that. But there's also this technology revolution going on for retail, hospitality, office place. Um, and it's sort of this omni-channel digital pan uh, fusion of all of this, right? So what happens here is in the middle of all this, you get this notion of branded experience design, whether it's a corporate office lobby or a healthcare experience or uh, hospitality, food, beverage. Um, it really drives a very different thought process, right? Now, moving on into the six trends. Uh, the first thing that we're gonna look at is luminous surfaces, where with LED technology, LEDs are sort of dematerialized lighting and we can now integrate luminosity in various forms into the surfaces that surround us. So pixels become everywhere. The second trend that we're gonna look at is data-driven experiences. So once we have all these luminous surfaces surrounding us, what are we actually programming them with? and can we add additional meaning? The third is interactive spaces. So once we have luminous surfaces everywhere and we have data-driven connected systems backing them, we can add an element of personal interactivity within these spaces. Now on the other side here, it's more of enabling technologies behind those three trends. These systems become very difficult to design and program and install. So we have to have a revolution there and that's what we call digital twin commissioning. Um, we also can't forget the, about the environment no matter what and that's gonna have a huge impact on lighting in the next 10 years. Uh, the circular economy is gonna drive new business models that impact how we create our spaces, how we service them and what we do at end of life. And then the final trend is gonna be looking at DC power uh, in support of net zero energy buildings and how that simplifies these systems altogether. So let's look at luminous surfaces. Modernism 
helped strip away a lot of quote unquote garish ornamentation. And with that, brass and glass chandeliers largely went out the window and architects wanted a sort of purity of form, a purity of materials. And with that, architects really want to treat light like a material, right? And it was too hard. In the old days, lighting solutions were hot, dangerous, fragile, objectified things. Well, now with solid state lighting like LEDs and OLEDs, lighting has become a material. Um, and it has dematerialized. And it has eliminated a lot of the maintenance headaches. So now you can do projects like what you see uh, Foster and Partners doing with their Apple stores, or they have these beautiful, clean, perfect planes of light. And this is great for just basic illumination, but there's so much more creative solutions you can do integrating light into wall surfaces. This was a R&D project that I led at Philips several years ago, where we integrated luminous patterns of light into wall surfaces. And in this case, we took the beauty of candlelight largely for hospitality applications and said to ourselves, what's beautiful about candlelight? It's the flicker, it's the soft animation, it's the sparkle along the edges of the uh, candle holder that you see. And we designed those into the wall surface and we digitally animated it and we used beautiful gold and white light LEDs to create this sort of magical feeling. We also looked at adding graphic design into this. So suddenly you have this fusion of not only light but of graphics. So we were looking at giving architects a fresh tool set to invigorate their spaces, right? The one problem with modernism is that they had beautiful marble and rosewood panels and we just have wall-to-wall -wall carpet and gypboard budgets. So how can we use sort of industrial materials and lighting and graphic printing and CNC digital production to add a visual richness back into our spaces? And you're gonna see a lot of this with this fusion of luminosity and material. Going on, of course, we get into the pixel world where suddenly surfaces become displays and they can become any size or shape you want. And then you get into this area though where we have these direct view LED screens where the pixel density and the resolution and the brightness is so high that they become something more. Right? I love this image where you're contrasting this huge digital screen from Samsung against concrete walls. Right? There's a permanence versus an impermanence here that's really uh, beautiful. What is that surface? Is it an architectural surface? It is a physical thing, but it becomes a portal to the world. So what do you put on there? Do you put the Grand Canyon? Do you put a scene from Blade Runner? What is it? Do you put a Coca-Cola ad on that wall? It becomes hugely important to think about the programming. So you see these notions of virtual reality, augmented reality, and an extended reality. And what that really is, is this blend between real life versus virtual. And somewhere in the middle, we're going to have this mixed reality where we have augmented experiences throughout our daily lives. And this really hit home to me uh, last year at the Integrated Systems Europe show in, uh, here in Amsterdam. If you're not familiar with it, it's the sort of AV show and a lot of digital signage. Sony had this screen that was magnificent. It was 8K native resolution. The pixels were only 1.2 millimeter pixel pitch. And it was shot, of course, beautiful Carnival in Brazil on Sony's pro-grade, cinema-grade cameras. It was a phenomenal experience because, just to give you some sense of scale, it was 9.7 meters wide, almost 32 feet wide, and five meters high. So when you stood next to this, about just only an arm's length away, you had a virtual reality experience. You lost pixels, they, didn't, they disappeared because it was such high resolution and the screen was so big, you felt utterly and totally immersed in that scene. You could see the uh, specks of glitter on the performers' faces. So this technology is only becoming cheaper, it's only becoming more widespread, we as designers, as architects, interior designers, and brand designers can't just ignore this. We have to engage these surfaces and come up with ways to more creatively use this. This was an example of a Balenciaga fashion show where the floor, the curving walls, the end walls were all digital screens. There was not a solid surface to be had. So then we have these big, beautiful walls. As I'm making the point, you need to consciously design what the data is that's going on them. And we can create now data-driven experiences. 
And that falls into two categories. So the first is sort of pure data. It's really environmental optimization. The second, though, is more of a media-driven. It's branded experiences. And if you think about what this is, it's really, on the left, we're talking smart buildings where you're trying to conserve energy or you're trying to increase performance. On the right, though, you're trying really to create immersive game, uh, game experiences, brand experiences, um, presentations, media clips, and so on. <clears throat> and here's a few examples that I had drafted out a couple of years ago to look at data in a really unique way to drive a space. I called it Wrap Your Spaces in Social Media. And this one was called Thumbs Up for a Cause, where you have a large wall surface that's a digitally animated screen. And as people click more likes to support a cause, in this case, breast cancer awareness, the screen shows you the aggregated uh, clicks. The next one was called Hot or Not in which you have a mannequin in a, a physical bricks and mortar store with a, a light sculpture around it. As the rate of purchases online for that same item increased, the rate of the light effect in the physical store would increase. So it would give the store clerks and the patrons a sort of intuitive ambient communications method of understanding, is this hot or not online? The third example was called sparkling service where we took uh, like the luminous patterns wall of the candlelight effect. And we took the average of customer service reviews for a restaurant and we applied that to the rate of sparkle. So in this case, you could have a manager of a restaurant walk in and one day he says, hey, how come our wall is not sparkling? And that might prompt him to look and say, oh gee, we had a bad week for service quality. So what you see behind the scenes here is that you have these ambient media visual modes, right? And on the left, we're driving them through social data streams. Now, in reality, this could be any range of data. This could be weather data, it could be stock market data, it could be number of people in a room, but in this case, I showed social media. So we had the hotter, uh, the uh, thumbs up for a cause was accumulation and translated to a color of a wall surface. The hotter not was the action rate of purchasing translated into the variation of a wall, of a sculptural object and then social proof was the average likes translated into a pattern of sparkles. So I think this is a rich area of innovation where a variety of different brands or experience operators could look at live data to create live responsiveness in their spaces. The next category is interactive spaces. So if we go this far and we have a data stream driving large wall surfaces, what can we do to involve the participants, the occupants of the space with that experience? So there's a lot of ways, obviously, we can easily add LED surfaces. We can do things like me and my shadow effects where your outline of your body is on the wall, but let's try to be a little more creative than that. Let's think about what are the meaningful interactions with architecture? So the first one is to deliver function, right? In the case of lighting, just simple lighting, it's the right light at the right place at the right time. But we can also deliver delight, right? And this is enriching human interactions by creating new memories, new experiences. And the third one is delivering content, right? Architecture as a portal to the virtual world. Now, sadly, too much of architectural lighting is just focused on function, right? How can we deliver all this light, eliminate glare? It's on all the time. We try our very hard to turn it off as much as we possibly can. But the two on the right are about human experience and creating heightened sort of brand awareness. And why would you want to do this? Well, this is a case of uh, Jason Bruges studio. This is in a children's hospital where these are very sick kids who are going for MRI scans or CAT scans and they get very nervous and that makes the scans, uh, the quality of the scans goes down. So in this case, the artist embedded LED lighting into the walls, behind the wallpaper with little animated animals. And this helps distract the kids. And they had an, a measurable improvement in the quality of the scans for first time because the kids were not nearly as scared. So we also can think through these trends in anonymous tracking, right? You can download open source software like TensorFlow that's free onto a $35 Raspberry Pi computer the size of an index, index card and start immediately training it to do these sorts of AI uh, uh, 
uh, camera vision solutions. And then you can get into anonymous facial recognition where there's more sophisticated systems out there where not only is it tracking a person, but it can gauge based on your face alone, it can estimate your sex, your age, and it can track how long you're there, what you're looking at, um, and it's still anonymous, right? And then we get into the, the heightened area where we combine facial recognition or other techniques with uh, customer relationship management, right? So when you walk into a store that you already have given your personal information to, or a hotel lobby, or an airline, or whatever, they recognize you and they can immediately respond to you on a personal basis. So you really have five ways to look at this. You can respond, you can interact with architecture through touch, through your physical proximity to an object or a wall surface. You can put your body into a zone where it can be sensed, the occupancy can be sensed. You can use stereo vision systems for precise tracking of multiple occupants within a space. Or you can use identity systems where you have RFID tagging to call out who you are. And how could you use this? Well, let's look at this in commercial office space where you might think, yeah, but there's no reason to have this in an office. This is an example of a, a conference room where you might have a color temperature changing pendant over the desk and some wall washing around it. If you can understand how many people are in the room, which is very different than just passive occupancy sensing, right? If you use a stereo vision camera and you say there's one or two people, you can have the light warm up. You could have the light more intimately focused around the table so that it's a more personal conversation. But as the room fills up, the stereo vision camera system can track that. It can understand that there's half a dozen people in this room. It might cool the color temperature off and it might open up the feeling of the room by increasing the ceiling lighting or the wall washing. So it creates a more comfortable, spacious environment so people don't feel as claustrophobic. How do you do all this though on a construction project? How do you design this? How do you roll this out, right? That's very difficult. But luckily we have some really strong trends in building information modeling and digital twin uh, setups that really lead to what I call digital twin commissioning. So we're all familiar with BIM. It's been promised now for I think almost two decades and there's been slow and steady progress with more and more projects adopting this. And it's really important that we move out of the old fashioned document mentality on these construction projects. Because as you see, a lot of what I'm describing are nearly impossible to specify or lay out in a paper-based documentation. The closest you could get would be more of a storyboarding solution that Hollywood uses in movies. Um, so once we move everything into a BIM cloud-based solution, we can get into BIM simulation. So within that cloud solution, we have a live digital model. Now, here's an example of a project, again, I did at Philips with the Philips research team and a student that was studying a game engine, the Unreal Engine. Now, this is what pro companies use to create PlayStation and Xbox games, but it's a live rendered piece with beautiful lighting effects. And we were looking at our luminous patterns walls and how do we help customers configure what they want, lay out the design, lay out the lighting effects, <clears throat> and then record that for both the project documentation that's needed and for our factory documentation. So using this live Unreal Engine, um, and behind the scenes you see it's all coding and algorithm driven, uh, we were able to create this this interface. Now this could work on a tablet, this could work on a touch screen. Uh, we had a live wall that was a one-to-one -one scale projection screen that you could project these effects on. Uh, but we also could use VR goggles uh, to let people be more immersed in it. It was a very flexible solution. So I think the future in the next year is you're going to see really a very tight integration of BIM with these live rendered engines. And I think you're gonna see product configurators move out of sort of online web pages into these live visualized worlds where once you're designed it, it's there, it's in the BIM model and you're done. There's no further paperwork, there's no commissioning, um, it's ready to go. So of course we have to be sustainable about all of this. And this is something, a big trend in lighting Lighting is just too expensive in most projects, and particularly when you're adding complexity like what I propose, 
right? We have to reduce the total life cycle cost to drive the adoption of these innovative applications. If we don't do that, we really will be stuck with 1960s style downlights and track spots and troughers forever. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna need is repairable fixtures. And this is sort of a flashback to the past where a lot of LED uh, manufacturers in pursuit of thermal efficiency and cost reduction gave up the sort of modular lamp and socket approach. Well, that has to come back. Um, we simply cannot make disposable lighting fixtures anymore. It's just irresponsible behavior on the point of the lighting industry. But we also have really cool things like smart maintenance. So now that we've digitally connected all of our light fixtures and they're all IP connected to a cloud service, very simple techniques within those fixtures can predict their failure. Simple things like counting the runtime, counting the light output rate uh, can create predictive maintenance. Um, beautiful factories is a topic I'll talk about in the next slide and biofriendly materials too. We have to be responsible as an industry for what we make. Like as, and if any of you are specifiers or designers, you have to be very aware that you are specifying the future. And you have to take accountability for what future you're specifying today. Now, I worked on a project quite a few years ago where I was trying to work with a leading sustainable architect and a sustainable office building. And I was challenging our product development team internally. And I said, you know, we need to make a sustainable fixture. And I was arguing with the engineers. They said, well, aluminum is perfectly sustainable. You can recycle it endlessly. And I was trying to argue for wood. And I said, you know, I understand aluminum can be recycled endlessly, but that just doesn't smell right. I said, would you want to live next to any part of the aluminum supply chain? Open pit mines, smelting facilities. Do you want to live downwind of a petrochemical plant that makes the powder coat paints? Do you want to live downstream of the toxic anodization plants? No, you don't want any part of that supply chain. You don't want it in your lives. You don't want it poisoning your children. You don't want to look at it. I said, well, what about uh, forests and bamboo and bio waste and stuff like uh, wood shops and products that you can simply throw in a field and let compost at the end of life? I don't think anybody has a problem living next to any stage of that supply chain. So this was a project I did as a, a fun side project last year. The U.S. Department of Energy Solid State Lighting Group uh, opened up a competition called the Manufacturing Innovator Challenge for Sustainable Manufacturing of Luminaires. And I created this project called the Bamboo Pendant. And it was very simply targeting the standard linear office pendant, which is a very well-known format. But what we said is we can look at a few trends here. Number one is we have very high efficacy LEDs. 200 lumens per watt is easily achievable. So the thermal problem goes away. Um, <clears throat> we also have DC power in these buildings now, so we can get rid of the onboard electronics. So we looked at this and we said, how can we eliminate screws or glue and any sort of high energy materials? And how can we eliminate petrochemicals as much as we possibly can from this? Uh, so we found a very interesting UK startup that makes uh, bio-based circuit boards. And it's actually made out of the waste product from flax fields, which is what's used to make linen. And at the end of life, you can soak these in water and scrape the electronics off. And then you throw the board into the field for composting. And you think about how different that is from our epoxy and fiberglass circuit boards that are used throughout this and the toxic legacy of you know, how the e-waste is disposed of, right? So we said we can use that as the light engine. Um, we can use glass. So glass has established recycling streams. We can use very simple parts and we can even use just a simple mortise and tenon joint, a classic woodworking joint. So that end of life, you bang the wood doll out, the end cap falls off and everything simply comes apart for recycling. So we need innovative products like this, no matter what the format is or what the application is, we need to embrace this circular economy or cradle to cradle standard and look at reducing our overall impact. I think another big trend you're gonna see in this decade, another supporting sort of infrastructure level piece is DC power. Um, 
you're already seeing major chains like Ikea and Target rolling out solar panels on their buildings. And the reason for that is very simple. Solar panels reached cost parity with grid power in many places around the world. So it's now cheaper for buildings to, in an effect, buy power from their own solar panels than it is to buy it from the grid. So that's why you see large operators embracing solar on a massive scale. Um, you also have the plunging cost of battery storage. So suddenly now you can also normalize your consumption and production throughout your daily cycle. And then if we really think hard about this, everything in a modern building, everything is effectively DC power. Your lighting, your sensors, your smart devices, your laptops, your screens, EV charging, data centers, your mechanical systems with variable speed drives, it's all DC power. So combining with the scale of the rollout, small savings are a big deal. So what happens here is you have these ancient uh, 240 and in the US 120 and 277 volt AC backbones, but everything going on to that is coming from a DC source, except for the old grid, which is coal power basically, and everything coming off of its DC power. So you have all this needless equipment that's wasting 10 to 20% of your efficiency every time you convert AC to DC or back again. And then on top of this, all you've seen so far is smart systems slathering on DC-based digital systems on top of these ancient AC systems. So this is why I believe smart systems have been very slow to be embraced because all they're doing is adding complexity onto these construction sites. They're not fundamentally removing complexity. What we really want though is we want systems where we can take the DC power <clears throat> from solar panels and funnel it with as little conversion as possible straight into our lighting, straight into our digital screens, into our digital devices. We want to store that also unconverted into battery storage and draw from it as we can, and then draw from the grid simply as backup. We can also do this for offices, particularly with USB-C now, you have a, a data and power outlet for all your devices that I believe is up to 90 watts of capacity. So the system then looks like this. You have a DC bus running at 375 or 750, which is quite common in things like data centers and big industrial applications. And you're keeping the solar onto it with very efficient conversions on and off. Then there's some secondary benefits like solid state fault interruptions where you can have circuit breakers now that are not mechanical, they're totally solid state. And you can even use that same technology to control LEDs because it's a current limited thing. So you can eliminate a massive amount of gear and equipment from your buildings. And of course, it's all fundamentally digital. So you're not slathering on a layer of building management stuff and smart devices and all this other nonsense. It, every board has digital fundamentally and you just connect it to a centralized IP backbone and you can monitor and control all of the data fundamentally. So you add this up, you see why I start to say this is infrastructure, because this project here is uh, by Electroland. It's um, a cable TV headquarters, I believe, in Los Angeles. It's a beautiful project, but it was also completed five years ago. Uh, but it really shows you where the technology was. I say, this is why we can't have nice things, because behind the scenes, this is what it looks like. You have massive AC to DC converters. You have huge data distribution power, uh, problem. You're not innovating the panels, so it's all basically glorified Christmas tree lighting that's stuck onto these custom panels. If we can't innovate behind the scenes, we can't keep doing these projects. They become one-off, very expensive art projects. So in the next 10 years, you're gonna see all of these things come together where you have panels that have embedded lighting, that are pixel controlled, that are fed with data and DC power, and they're going to be fabricated using sustainable materials smartly for um, end-of-life considerations. So with that, uh, I will conclude my presentation. Once again, I'm Brad Kerner. I'm VP of Product Development at SEMA. 
SEMA is a growing architectural signage and lighting manufacturer based in the United States, north of Philadelphia. Feel free to email me or connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, if you're interested in this sort of futurist notions of lighting and environmental design, check out my long running blog at lucep.com. And with that, James, do we have any questions or comments from the audience? Thank you, Brad. That was, um, that was excellent. It covered a lot of ground. Um, yeah, as Brad said, if there are any questions, um, please put them in. We'd love to, love to hear from you. So now's the time. Um, we covered a lot of ground there, so I'm sure there are plenty of, um, of things that people want to ask. Uh, yeah, great. I mean, from, from my perspective, uh, I thought, well, there's so much to unpick there. There's a lot I was interested in, but um, I think, like, looking at some of the notes I made, um, where you were talking about data plus media, I thought that was, for, from my perspective, really, really interesting. Uh, you know, we, we write a lot about um, smart buildings and obviously the data aspect of getting data out of sort of sy systems like... Uh, building management or uh, energy management, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yeah. one of the things I think often we find is that that kind of stuff is so remote from, uh, you know, the people that actually use buildings um, that we really do need to think about more immersive experiences, right? Because I think that provides the feedback loop. Like if we're really interested in creating buildings that are more user-friendly have better user experience like that's going to be part of it right being able to feed back information to to people yeah you know one of one of my biggest frustrations working for 20 years in the lighting industry is that it seems like 90 percent of all the technology uh r d that goes into lighting has been for the sole point of turning our products off more Right. Like that's the highest goal of all of this technology. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. <clears throat> and we have these smart buildings now that are even like the kind of, hopefully the, the culmination of that bad trend where you're putting thousands of data sensors into these buildings for this precision control, these massive streams of data. But in the end, the only thing you're returning to that space is turning lights off more efficiently. Um, there's got to be something more, right? There, mm -hmm. There's a fundamental beauty and power of lighting and using it to enrich life. And I think that's why this whole circadian rhythm, healthy lighting thing has been so powerful in that it's getting people who don't ever really think about lighting to think about, oh, wow, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, light impacts my health. Maybe I should think about it a little more. Mm -hmm. But frankly, there's so much you can do with great lighting design to create wonderful, effective, healthy environments to live, work, and play in before you ever get into the biological necessity of blue light uh, and uh, melanopic response. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I actually, I wrote that down as well, because I think one of the concepts you showed there about combining the kind of occupancy sensing with intelligent lighting in meeting rooms makes a lot of sense, right? Like you again something we've covered this this concept of being able to understand how many people are in a building and that's a lot just being used on a really fundamental level of just being able to understand how people you are using your building and your space but then you know if we take if we extrapolate that out like being able to combine it with um intelligent lighting and that changes color depending on you know what you're doing would be again, like um, a, a great user experience. I mean, yeah. how, how, how far away do you think we are from things like this? <clears throat> well, all the technology exists today. I mean, everything I described actually is there, mm -hmm. right? So it's, no, it's not like it's got to be invented from thin air in some huge, you know, Bell Labs, Xerox Park of course, R&D yeah. facility anymore. It's all sitting out there. It's just a matter of, you know, what companies are going to be the most daring and the most innovative. And, you know, really, it's going to come down to architects, lighting designers, brand managers for pushing this stuff, right? They, they have to start pushing for real sustainability, right? Or they have to start pushing for 
really truly innovative experiences that connect lighting with digital signage with check-in you know in the case of a hotel with the check-in solution uh, with you know walking into your room so that the lighting remembers who you are that that lighting automatically knows what your preferences are and then also would know what time zone you're on so that it could help you by kind of forcefully adding or subtracting blue light battle jet lag right mm -hmm. um, these are the scenarios that i'm not hearing anybody talking about in lighting right we have energy savings as like 99 percent of the industry <clears throat> any sort of interactive really interactive stuff has been kind of largely constrained to art which is just kind of wild and you know for spectacle you got the the theater world comes up with fantastic technologies theater and entertainment in fact that's where most of the great technologies that we've adopted in architectural lighting have come from but again, that's mostly just for spectacles. So you get a few companies like Team Labs and Moment Factory, which are creating really beautiful immersive experiences, but they're always kind of like ticketed special event spectacles. So where, where is the art? You know, where, where is the lighting design community in trying to break out of the norm here? Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I entirely agree. Well, enough from me. We've got a bunch of questions coming for you, Brad. So um, let's get on and, and, and answer these. Uh, one here for you. Um, what do you think about uh, DALI lighting? Um, how does that fit into the future, DALI, or is it? Um, I mean, how do you see that progressing? Well, every standard helps. I'm a huge, huge proponent of standards. And unfortunately, the lighting industry just has some forces, structural forces in terms of the middleman structure that really defeat any sort of standardization, right? And that is why we don't have uh, scalable platforms that allow smaller companies to create, you know, cr creative components and solutions off of those core things. So DALI is one of the few standards the lighting industry has that's been around forever. I mean, it's an ancient technology by standard, um, by technology standards, um, but it's valid. I mean, DMX and DALI and zero to 10 are never going away just because they're dependable standards that help build up systems so that other companies two independent companies can control each other's equipment and talk to each other without needing some sort of special take on that, right? So we desperately need more of that. In fact, um, you know, I, DALI is, is just, a, like I said, it's an ancient technology. It's never going to go away. It's very valid. It's very needed. Um, you know, I'm very frustrated. Like, for example, I have now kind of a, a pan global view on some of these things, you know, in the U S you just have these packaging games by the rep agencies and the, the lighting controls fall into that. They fall victim to that. So you have guys like Lutron and Crestron basically duplicating each other's systems, right? So instead of one specializing in like beautiful front end controls and one company specializing in like excellent dimmer racks to compete in that business, they have to make every single silly little switch and wall plate and feature and it just means that the innovation isn't there They're, they spend their efforts and their product marketing and product management times making commodity products mm. um, and, and it's not just controls it's you know everyone is guilty of this if yeah. we if we look at the the internet world right the standards like bluetooth wi-fi ip connectivity have built you know, trillions of dollars of value, right? And, and in fact, I think you're going to see, sadly, I think the only innovation you're going to see in the lighting world now is going to come from outside of the lighting world. It's going to be adapted by small companies that can build on these other standards. <clears throat> so standards are hugely important. Um, there is a, a standard that I just saw, and I forget its name. It's something like GFTT or something like that. Um, that's coming out of the theater world where they're trying to make a file format standard where you have the 3D representation of the fixture, you have the data, uh, what the data flows are of that fixture so that mostly this is used in theater consoles where you're trying to put something into WYSIWYG 
and program it without having to go to a manufacturer's proprietary standard. The architecture world needs that too, right? We need a we need like the IES photometry file, like generation two of that, where it includes BIM information, it includes IP connectivity information, it includes all the functionality of that fixture in a digital format. All right, we desperately need that as an industry. Mm -hmm. We are going to get through everyone's questions, so at least we can try to. Uh, a couple more here for you, Brad. Um, I've got a couple about power over Ethernet. Um, how do you view that? One here, power over Ethernet using IP and DC power fits into the DC building vision very well. Just curious um, why you didn't mention PoE. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, no, PoE is a a uh, very interesting conundrum, right? It's been around for a long time. Uh, I think as early as 2008, I think Redwood Systems was one of the first companies out there that did this. Um, you know, if you, if you look at it very abstractly, right, every light fixture and sensor, and I, that light fixture, I don't care if it's that 8K Sony screen or, or just a light bulb, at its heart now, you need two things. You need DC power because that's the way LEDs work. And you need IP connectivity because everything is digitally networked, right? That's the future. So what's the most efficient way to deliver DC power and IP connectivity to your light source? Um, that's why POE has had this kind of obvious, uh, obvious attraction to it in that it, it's delivering DC power and IP connectivity through a low cost, you know, non-union installed uh, wiring protocol, right? It should, it should be a huge success. Um, but, you know, I think what happens here is I've seen this is that well-meaning engineers kind of shoot themselves in the foot because they start arguing over, you know, very small, you know, fine tooth things like is, you know, is your uh, losses along the length of wire worth it? You know, why can't it be uh, uh uh, series wiring instead of star wiring and just silly arguments like that. And they just miss like the overall project cost benefits of those systems where you're reducing um, the coordination, the design, you're reducing the on-site commissioning, you're reducing the installation labor. It should be a no brainer, but these things get defeated by well-meaning sort of product people and engineers uh, in the, the lighting companies. I think you're going to see a lot more of it though. Mm -hmm. uh, something else here, uh, interesting, going back to your, uh, your slide on mixed reality. Um, can you say something about monetizing the content? Um, if you're building an interactive or mixed reality installation, would you build for updating recurring information or entertain entertaining content? How will this affect future revenue models? It's a, it's a great, great point, actually, isn't it? It does open up the possibility for different types of uh, revenue. Yeah, it's a fascinating topic. Really, um, it, it, depends, it depends very strongly on what segment you're talking about, right? So obviously, commercial office building has very different intentions than a healthcare facility as opposed to a hotel versus a shopping mall, right? So, you know, putting a um, sort of obviously in private environments, you don't, you're not going to monetize things. There's service opportunities, there's maintenance opportunities, there's optimization opportunities. Um, but I think the question here is content. Can you monetize content on these systems? And I don't, I don't believe that. Right. Uh, you know, and I think this is frankly, sadly, where a lot of architects really don't like digital surfaces because they know that if if a developer's got um, got it in his head that he can pay for these systems because they've always been very expensive. You know, he's going to put Coca-Cola ads and Heineken ads and, you know, whatever on there. And that, and that means the architect loses control of their building design. Right. Mm. So this was actually the genesis of the luminous patterns concept where I said there's a space between a digital media wall and, and just lighting where you have kind of fixed patterns of light, but they're still using digital control for effect. Um, you know, I, 
I think we have to be very careful here on trying to think of content as, mon as monetary streams. You know, if you think about what I'm saying, there's a lot of optimization based on energy needs, based on human health needs. There's a lot of brand representation. If you think about a hotel application, you know, Marriott wants their digital content to be distinctively different than Hilton. Um, I don't see there's a lot of room for monetizing content. I think there'll be a lot of opportunity for making content, right? Graphic designers, motion illustrators are skills that frankly, architecture firms need to embrace, lighting designers need to embrace, right? You have to come up with almost, uh, you have to add the skill of storyboarding into the design process, which if you've ever looked at like behind the scenes films on Hollywood, storyboarding is a beautiful art in and of itself mm. that is desperately needed in the built professions right now. Um, but no, I, I guess my answer to that is, you know, I don't see a lot of that. I, I think you're going to see that in shopping malls and the urban environment, any place where digital out of home signage is already working. Um, and has a place, you'll see that expanding into ambient media. You're going to see that expanding into uh, the surfaces that surround us. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, here's another question for you. Um, are you able to overcome resistance from IT people and from construction professionals? Um, oh, <clears throat> and there's, yeah, that's a, <laughs> um, and there's a couple more bits to this question as well. Um, uh, but yeah, cover that first and then we can ask the, the next bit. Well, you know, I don't know where I heard this data point, but I would like to confirm it. Maybe James, even you know this, but I think out of all the global industries, construction is the only one that lost productivity in the past decade where every other industry in the world has gained productivity. And I think it's these ridiculous construction project coordination and turf wars that just crush innovation in the built environment, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think it's very instructive that I've now seen more than a few lighting control systems put a cellular modem in their uh, control, whatever the head is, head box for that unit. Yeah, and that says something about bypassing this, it, IT, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you, and you think to yourself, any logical person who doesn't know construction would say, well, that's just stupid, right? You're, it's, you're in the IT closet. There's like your, your T1 connection is sitting right there. Just pull a cat five cable and you're, and you don't need that. But when you realize how miserable it is to coordinate with systems integrators, IT managers, safety, security functions, just to get that simple internet connection so you can control your lighting or update your lighting once in a while. You see why so many lighting controllers put cellular modems in. Um, you know, if we can't as an industry, and I mean the building industry globally, get over these sort of petty divisions, you're never gonna really have widespread adoption of these innovations. Mm. Uh, second part to the question was um, how do you cater for emergency lighting in all this that's an interesting area isn't it because it's well regulated but is there a possibility for for um, you know innovation in that area as well oh for sure well I mean first off if you think about what I said right you have basically islanded DC power in a modern building. So my first question to you is, can't all, most of the emergency lighting functions be handled through that system, right? You have batteries, you have huge battery storage now, centralized in the building, um, you know, with solar panels on there. If you remove that AC grid connection, you can island your whole building, which means you don't need uh, the, the Hertz synchronization with the grid for everything to run. So first off then, I mean, how much of your lighting can you run? I mean, you should be able to run for days your entire lighting system uh, on that, that battery storage. Um, if you can't go for the big move like that, then, you know, of course, it's a lot simpler when you're already using DC fixtures and uh, DC distribution, even if you're down to more of a localized room scale, right? It should be much more cost effective 
to distribute batteries and connection systems throughout there. Um, and then, you know, if you're talking about integrating in with um, more of the video screens, the um, embedded lighting, the embedded digital screens, I think you're always going to have some more traditional down lights, you know, hiding. Um, I mean, you could very creatively turn on a, any sort of screen or any sort of surface just to default to an emergency on white solution and provide plenty of lighting. Um, but that, you know, that, that smart designers, smart lighting designers and the electrical engineers on these projects, like they shouldn't be afraid to innovate in that space. I think people are just so afraid of the mythical code inspector that comes through and denies you that they just refuse to change. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, again, that's really not a, not a acceptable reason industry wide to snuff out innovation in that area. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some questions about um, the, what you presented about DC power. I think that's some, um, sparked a lot of interest. Um, one here, how do you convince building developers to accept the risk of designing a building with distributed DC infrastructure? Um, will there be replacement products? Is there enough of an ecosystem of DC products to deliver the experience? Yeah, that is a really tough, tough question right now. So r right now, the DC power world um, is in its infancy for sure. Um, you really, you know, DC power is going to start at <clears throat> really the visionary developers who are doing the most proactive, sustainable buildings, right? These are the sorts of, there's plenty of these people out there, you know, these are the sorts they're doing Google and Facebook headquarters or um, any sort of corporate building where they're looking for cutting edge sustainability as a marketable feature not just for making the real estate sale, but for the occupant of that space wants to market sustainability and they need tangible uh, concrete items that they can use in their own brand building activities. So I think you're going to start there. Like look at Apple with their huge spaceship building and the massive amounts of solar they put on that, right? You can think about if they could save just a few percentage points of the, the consumption, the power consumption in that building switching through DC, that would add up to just massive amounts of savings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, think the next, I think the next phase you're gonna see though is much more uh, measured and smaller baby steps. So if you think about these projects like I showed uh, Ikea and Target, right, where they have fields of solar on their roofs, right? What they could do is they could retrofit areas or sections of their store. Um, so DC power has some logical ways. If you're, if you need to get into like, um, shop fittings that you want to change on a more frequent basis, um, and you don't want to bring an electrical contractor back in to do it. Right. So you have now glowing shelves, you have digital signage on the shelves, on the end units. You might have uh, interactive display systems. All of that can be powered with DC drops. Right, so suddenly there's a very compelling business case there that it only takes one or two transformations of that space where you're not pulling, you know, a, a highly expensive paid electrician back into that space to justify probably the small differential price that you're going to pay on DC power um, up front. Right, we're just talking about early adopters for innovation because. You know, in effect, these systems are reducing complexity. You're, you're taking junk out of the system. So it's only sad that you're paying a premium on any of this stuff because it's just, you know, the stuff is in low volumes. You don't get economies of scale right now. You know, you need the early adopters to embrace this stuff and push it forward. Um, there are companies in the U.S. There are a couple companies that are doing pro-grade, you know, D.C. systems for lighting. Uh, even Acuity announced that they're launching, you know, uh, linear office products in DC. You've got quite okay. an ecosystem now of power over Ethernet. Um, there's enough there between enough different suppliers that if you're really adventurous, you can bolt together a complete system. And there's a there's a lot of DC going on in here in Europe. Um, you know, I I think you're going to see a lot of the solar companies are going to be the first <clears throat> if they're smart about this. 
they're going to be the ones that put a DC backbone in between their solar panels and the charging, the battery. So then it makes perfect sense just to extend that out into the uh, consumption. Yeah, that would make sense, wouldn't it? Another question here for you, Brad. Uh, within the smart offices with automatically adjustable lighting, do you think there is still space for individually controlled on desk lighting? Or has this type of lighting become obsolete? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because on one hand, that is a you know user experience benefit, but it doesn't yeah. really help with the overall um, uh, aesthetic, does it? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is just a long running problem since like basically the 1950s, right? Where those open offices were designed for like industrial production, but you know, it was people on typewriters instead of rivet guns. Um, if you want to create personalized space for people and personal tailorization, first you gotta, you know, I'm an architect by training, right? So I'm not gonna forgive bad architecture uh, or try to use lighting to solve bad fundamental space concepts and, and uh, furniture layouts, right? So you got to get that straight. Uh, you can't have, you know, open offices where people are sitting cheek to jowl with, you know, 0.7 meters of space with a, you know, indirect lighting above you or something like that and expect to mm. offer personalized lighting. Like that just mm. doesn't jive, right? Um, there's a, there was a, beautiful concept and i i put this on lucep.com i actually called it you know quarantining the scourge of open offices because i'm not a fan of open offices um they just don't work most of the time i think there's a lot of growing scientific evidence that proves their inefficiency but i saw this concept that lg right did with their oled tv screens i think about three years ago at the uh, salone show in milan where they made these like individual desks that were all this like gorgeous double-sided translucent OLED screens. And it's just magnificent. And um, even going uh, way back when I was at Color Kinetics back around 2005, we were working with Steelcase. Uh, and this was, very, remember, very early days of LED lighting, white light components that were high power had just come on the market then. They weren't very good quality. Uh, but we were working with Steelcase on taking out some of the standard cubicle panels and replacing them with translucent uh, uh, surfaces backlit with RGB lighting and allowing a cubicle dweller to change the color of their lights. And uh, that's always stuck with me as that's just an obvious place that if you're going to put divider panels between people now because of pandemics or whatever or acoustic separation or visual separation, right? You, you can easily make those panels glowing, number one. You could make them color temperature changing so they can follow circadian rhythm, number two. Or number three, you can make them digital displays and then they can be anything you want. So you can show ambient communications, you can show personalization if someone wants to be surrounded by beautiful images of Tahiti and that just so happens to follow your daily rhythm. So you're getting blue light in the morning from that beautiful image of Tahiti and then the setting sun in the afternoon. I mean, there's just so much innovation that can go on here uh, when you rethink the division of a personal office space, right? You don't need to go to private rooms, but you certainly can't have like a bunch of people gang together in a boiler room environment uh, and, and do any of that creativity. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, one uh, interesting question here, which I think would be a good point to finish on. Um, who could be the mediator in projects like these? Uh, the architect, lighting designer, systems integrator, or technical advisor? What do you think, Brad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, you're, I think the person here is asking me, which four of those groups do you want to piss off and which one do you want to <laughs> support? Um, I'm actually going to... Uh, that's It's none of the above. Um, there, there needs to be sort of a, a new mindset here where you're, you're, you're really an experienced designer. Um, so I actually think this is quite fascinating how Gensler has a whole sort of digital experiential design group where they're working on this. And I think you see some of these bigger, more, more progressive like architectural firms realize that they, you know, their customers are asking for digital solutions throughout their spaces and they need a competent response to that at, at the highest level. You know, architects are generally 
the the coordinators now, right? Jacks of mm -hmm. all trades, masters of none. They deal mm -hmm. with, you know, if you look at a modern construction book, it has 30 consultants listed on it, right? Um, you know, no, no one group is stepping up, right? And the problem is, is if you don't get a group that really looks at the problem holistically, you just get a bunch of overpriced specialists and then it's too expensive and it all just gets veed off the project anyway. Right, yeah. You know, I, I would like to back up lighting designers too. I mean, I was a lighting designer for many years. I just think lighting designers are stuck in this notion of independence, um, which is not helpful at a, a kind of project scale they need to be aligned with content they need to be aligned with digital systems and they need to be deeply involved with the innovation and the development of these systems and not just from a you know sales guy comes in with a lunch and learn and you know gets a few comments back but i think you're going to see a lot of these companies are going to look more like maybe moment factory um some of these most progressive little firms that are doing like experience design. I just saw today there was this fascinating company called um, Sharp End or something. Yeah, Sharp End. Um, it's a London firm that calls itself the agency of things, right? Which is using the internet of things uh, to drive sales, right? To drive fast moving consumer goods sales. And it's, it's just kind of a fascinating hybrid and I'm saying maybe that's the thing that cracks the nut of getting um, interactivity and retail applications, which has been kind of languishing for two decades now, that you're going to have the actual merchandise companies pushing for this in the store environments because the retailers seem to be the last people to ever embrace uh, technology. Um, so I think you're, gonna, you're not going to see any of those groups that you mentioned or, or, or frankly, you're going to see all of them in some small parts doing this. Um, it's a really tough nut to crack. It feels like there's, this is an area that's ripe for innovation, for service innovation, for, for project customers. Yeah, um, I agree. And uh, yeah. I, I don't think we know the answer yet. No, no. I mean, there's an interesting comment here. Um, is the digital twin the mediator? Um, all the impacts of ideas, changes, one party wants to implement are quickly and accurately reflected in all aspects of the project. Well, it's certainly the repository for it, I would say, isn't it? Um, yeah, the one, hopefully, uh, the idea being the one source of truth, I suppose, of, yeah. of that, whatever it is. Yeah, fascinating. Well, um, I'm sorry we've kind of come to an end now, um, run out of time, but Brad, it was... Uh, fascinating talking to you um really really good content and i know a lot of people expressed their thanks to you already so um one thing i will say to everybody listening uh, we have recorded this and uh, we'll make sure that's available um you can come to our website memory.com um it should be up later today or tomorrow uh, yeah I great think, um that's really it uh Brad, um, I think you, you've got on the screen your, your contact details there because we didn't get to answer all of the questions. I'm sorry, but um, if, uh, if you do have any uh, questions, um, Brad, are you you're happy, I'm sure, to, to take them? Absolutely. I'm happy to Good. connect, like I said, email, LinkedIn, check out my blog, however you send a carrier pigeon, whatever you want. <laughs> Yeah, that's so that, that wraps it up. Um, thanks again to everyone for listening. And thanks, Brad. Um, we'll be back next month with, uh, with another webinar. Thanks again, Perfect. guys. Thank you, James. Bye-bye.